Well, I walked in the door about um, 20 minutes ago, and Shauna saw me coming, and she said, Mary and Crash, she said, how are you? How are you? Are you here to see Mickey? What are you doing? I said, I thought I was speaking for you. <laughs> and she said, oh, yeah. Well, she had two of us booked. So we flew a toss of the coin, and I won. So this is who you have today. <laughs> so we'll do Jeremy another time. So I understand this is a class on entrepreneurship. Um, and Shauna had sent me a little brief um, synopsis of kind of what the class was about and what they hoped to accomplish within the class. And as I read that, I thought, and I have about 30 minutes to accomplish that for, uh, for me today. It was kind of a big thing. So it said, cultivate the, steward, the student's entrepreneurial mindset. Okay, that was my first thing. Identify their opportunities vetting their opportunities, and then how to execute the idea. Okay, so we're going to cover all those things in 30 minutes. Get your pens out. The fact that you are here, for me, is a huge part of cultivating, cultivating the entrepreneurial uh, mindset because the fact that you already have identified that you want to be an entrepreneur, that you think maybe you have what it takes to be an entrepreneur, puts you miles ahead of the rest of the population and particularly miles ahead of me, of where I was at your age. I, I just want to know, like, wh I want to hear from you. What makes you think you want to be an entrepreneur? Well, anybody? What about being an entrepreneur excites you? Being your own boss. Being your own boss. Fallacy number one. What else? <laughs> Big bucks. Fallacy number two. <laughs> In the back. Culture. Culture. Okay. It can be that you are your own boss. But when you are the bottom line responsible for everything that happens, it seems like everyone else is your boss, okay? Big bucks, maybe, if you're one of the few. But there are tons of people out there in entrepreneurial situations that maybe get big bucks, and maybe they don't. Culture, probably. Because whether or not you want to make big bucks and whether or not you end up having that sense that you're own, your own boss, you do determine your own culture of what you decide you're going to surround yourself with. And I do love that part. Anything else? Any other thoughts about why you want to be an entrepreneur? Yes? The excitement is something new every day. You're always changing. You're always looking for new ideas. I think that actually can be a great part of being an entrepreneur. It is always exciting, sometimes extremely scary. Um, and some people in, have kind of that sick mindset where they interpret exciting and scary as the same thing. It's called the fear factor, you know. <laughs> um, but it can be very exciting. Anything else? Any other reasons? Yes? Do you get to reap what you sow? What, what you put into it will be what you get? A lot more sometimes in being an entrepreneur than in working that typical eight to five job. You absolutely um, determine your outcome. It, there's really no limit to what you can do and your potential when you are your own entrepreneur. Yes? It gives me the opportunity to do what's important to me. I love that. And what is important to you? The things that I'm passionate about and what's important to me. Do you know what those are? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm interested in the healthcare industry. Great. And you're passionate about that? Yeah. Okay. I love that. That's, that ties in great. You guys are just giving this lecture. Love this. Okay. Uh, oftentimes, people who do not do these things, it's not that they don't want these things. <coughs> people are looking to be their own boss. People are looking to set their own culture. Everyone wants to, you know, make a, a good living wage. Everyone wants to follow their dream, their passion. Um, everyone f wants to kind of having an exciting job rather than working the same job on an assembly line for the next 30 years of their life. Everyone kind of wants this. But why are you here and not everyone else in this student body? They're all a bunch of sheep. Bingo. <laughs> 
To a large part, it's fear. Fear keeps people from reaching out and grabbing their dreams. They're afraid of their own inabilities. They're afraid they're not going to be able to make it. They're afraid they don't have what it takes. They're afraid because of their upbringing, they don't have the class they need. They're afraid that they don't have the money that they're gonna need. They're afraid their friends are gonna make fun of them. They're, they're, they're afraid. The fact that you are here says that you've begun, you've begun to, tam, to tame the fear factor, which is huge in being an entrepreneur. Fear cannot be a part of your game. And if it is part, that's all right, because fear then can motivate you to be excited about the next step in your life. I went kicking and screaming down the road of entrepreneurship. I did not want to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to play it safe. When I graduated, I went to school in an eight to five job for the state who provided me a steady income, who paid my insurance, that, you know, I was good to go there. And if my husband wanted to be an entrepreneur, which I thought that he did, that was all great and good. But I was all about security. So security and being an entrepreneur do not necessarily go hand in hand. Because security has something to do with fear. You have to be able to let go in order to grab. I graduated from BYU, the other university, which we used now, when I first started helping out here at the UVU, it was like some sort of a badge of honor that you graduated from BYU. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I graduated from the BYU. You know, because you guys are the largest university in the state. You're the up and comers, you're the real people. This is, this is where it's happening. This is where I am putting almost all of my efforts in supporting the student body. So I graduated from the other university, but I graduated at a time when, what do women go to BYU for? Let's hope that some go for education, but let's think back about 35 years, okay? 35 years ago, most of the time you went to BYU to get married. And of course, in preparing for that, I got my degree in CDFR, which was what 90% of the women there got, child development and family relations. Because not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's what I knew what my life was about. That's why I was there. And then when I graduated from BYU, I mean, I strung my education out as long as I possibly could just to get married and still graduated then with my four year degree at age 25. Still wasn't married. Stayed here at, uh, in Provo and uh, began working in, and then realized I could not get a job in CDFR. So I went back and got my social work degree and then was working. Finally, at age 27, prayed to my father in heaven and said, listen, if you don't find me somebody pretty soon, I'm gonna move and I'm talking to Orem, you know. <laughs> So I was well versed in what the state looked like in working eight to five and pretty happy with having the security that was provided there. I, my father, however, had been an entrepreneur, a very small entrepreneur. I was from Iowa and a very small town of 250 people. And in this town of 250 people, when my father came home from the war in 1945, realized that this little town, which supported all the farmers around that community, of course we all know about how great farmers are now, right? After Sunday? Yeah. You didn't watch the Super Bowl? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's all about Paul Harvey and the Dodge. I went out and bought the Dodge the next day because he's, you know, it was a great poem. So in this community, as he came home from the war, he realized that there wasn't, um, back then we called them filling stations, where you would get gas for the farmers to run their tractors. So we opened up a little filling station in this town, 250 people. And then as that farming community began to grow, he realized they didn't have a place to buy their lumber for their barns. And so he opened up a little young lumber yard. And then he realized that, that 
farmers were becoming somewhat successful in the 50s and they, they needed a place to, to buy their appliances, their washers, their dryers. And, and, and then as those farms got bigger, they needed plumbing supplies and, and they needed hardware and they needed to be able to come in and say, yeah, I need a 230 nut and this and that and fit on that, you know. And, and he'd be like, oh, I got that and just went back. And, and so he saw a need and in his small little way began to become an entrepreneur. And I can remember working with him in the store and watching him and his way he handled his customers and the service oriented he was. And I would go with him, he'd get called in the middle of the night. You know, a farm was out of gas. Back then it was bottled gas and they didn't have, you know, piped natural gas. So he'd get in his pickup late at night, take bottled gas out to them because he just couldn't bring himself to allow those farmers to get up in the morning and not have heat in their homes. And the act of service that I saw him perform, he was scared to death of dogs. Every farm had a dog. He would deliver this gas and I'd go with him whenever I could because I would jump out of the pickup first, make friends with the dog, and then he'd quick book out the gas and we'd get back in. My dad was a great example to me, but I also saw the amount of hard work it took and the hours away from the family. And I'm like, I don't want anything to do with that. I want a regular job. However, life had something else in store for me. And at age 27, I did marry someone. And within the first two years, I began to realize that his, at the time, um, we called it manic depressive, now we call it bipolar, uh, was not going to allow him to ever hold down a full-time job. That's my phone. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to silence it. But, but your mind, your, you know, your ear tunes it, it hears it no matter when it rings, where it is. I think that's my phone. Um, and so I realized that I had three choices as I looked at my life in front of me. I got pregnant on my honeymoon, so I already had one child. My second child came along right after that. And I had a counselor that we were in the middle of seeing um, a number of different counselors say to me, Mary, you have three choices. You can decide to be on church welfare the rest of your life. You can divorce him now and be on welfare the rest of your life. <laughs> or you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps and dig down deep and support this family. I didn't like any of those options. I did not want to be an entrepreneur, but I also knew I was not going to leave my children in daycare. So I had to come up with something that I could have my children with me and still make enough money to support my family. <clears throat> Identify opportunities, point number two. So, as you begin to identify your opportunities, the very first thing that I believe you should do is something that you mentioned, and that is discover your passion. What are you passionate about? I've been doing what I do for 28 years, and I still love to go to work in the morning. I get up in the morning, my feet hit the ground, I'm like, what's ahead of me today? I love to go. I love the creativity of it. I love being there and creating new menus and new designs and, and thinking about how I'm going to do something. I went yesterday and, and um, John Huntsman's granddaughter's getting married and by golly, they're going to have a nice wedding. And they called me. <laughs> so and I said, so what are we going to do? And I'm thinking something, you know, she says, I want to have a carnival. Really? Hot dogs? Yes. Cotton candy? Yes. Really? So in my brain, now I'm all of a sudden like going through this crazy, and I, and I see these, the, my butlers going around with these big hawker trays offering a beautiful selection of candies, and I, I see over here tents with, with bistro lights in them, and they're, and they're grilling little sliders, and then there's this over there, and out here we have a popcorn station where they're scooping popcorn and giving people for takeaways, not just a little bag of popcorn. This is the Huntsman's. This is a big bag of popcorn, you know, and it's not just any popcorn. It's going to be bacon bourbon popcorn and chili lime popcorn and s'mores popcorn and cookies and cream popcorn. And, you see my brain? I love that part of the creativity. Next thing I love about going to my job every day is I get to talk to people. I get to talk to you. 
I'm not sitting in there in a cubicle looking down, doing my little typing thing. I do that at home late at night. It's called my computer. But when I'm at work, I'm with people. I'm talking to my chefs. I'm talking to people on the phone. I'm talking to my managers. I'm making, you know, this morning I was in a big deal. And I'm selling my building here in Orem. I'm going to buy a new one. Last year I bought a building in downtown Salt Lake. <sighs> that was really scary. But I did it. So, discover your passion. What it is that gets you exciting. Could you see my passion start to come out as I started talking about that stuff? I came alive. So what is it that you do that brings out that kind of passion in you? When you start talking about it, people are just like, wow, she's really passionate about that. Then discover what you can do better than anybody else. So you've got passion, you've got, and then do that passion better than anybody else. Like you may have a passion, and I like have a passion, for singing. I love to sing. I could break into song for you right now, and I could like do song and dance, you know, I always wanted to go to Broadway. I just could sing my heart out. But I couldn't do it better than anybody else. Probably not good enough to go to Broadway. Maybe not even enough to get into a community theater, okay? So I had to find something that I was passionate about that I could also be better at than anybody else. And then the last piece is identify a need within your community. No, no things here, huh? Okay, sure. That's all right. So, passion what you can do better than anybody else, and a need that your community has. Where those three circles intersect is the sweet spot. It's where your golden opportunity lies. Thank you. See, I could have had a PowerPoint. There you go. Passion, better than anybody else, a need in the community. That spot right there, that's your sweet spot. That's where all those things you talked about are. Your own boss, big bucks, set in your own culture, get to be passionate, get to be the big kahuna, that's where it is. When I realized who then was my husband, I was married to him for 28 years, when finally I felt it was time to go. And um, I now married 18 months to someone else, and Shauna, that's part of the exploits that she follows on Facebook, because I'm having the time of my life. And how fun it is to have someone who has the same free spirit that can just get in the car with me and start driving and show up and say, well, what are we going to do in Vegas? I don't know. I hate it. Let's go on to La Jolla. <laughs> you know? Right. Yes. You know, I've given this uh, talk to entrepreneurial students for probably 10 years, and you're the first person who's ever asked me that. So let me just think for a second. <laughs> okay, I got, I got it. I got it. If you first identify passion, this is going to be big, so write it down. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. 
Um, if you first identify passion, things you're passionate about, okay? And you physically make a list. I'm a list maker. I'm one of those nutsy people that if I, if I do something before I got it, have it written down on a list, I write it down just so I can mark it off. So you write down the things you're passionate about that you really think passion lies. And then you think about what things can I, because you're naturally good at these things. I'm not a bad singer. Maybe not the best, but I'm not bad. So, but you write down the things that you're passionate about. And then as you look at that list, you think about which ones of these will I still be passionate about in 30 years? Okay. Yeah. 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 Two things I think I could still be passionate about in 30 years. Okay? What are my ideas that drive this? So, if passion, say for example, healthcare, you're passionate about healthcare. So, you might think, I'm passionate about healthcare because I have this idea and I have this idea. Have they ever been thought of before? Has anyone ever tried those before? Have they been successful before? If you can answer no, then that's the beginning. They've never been tried before. Yes, they've been tried before, and yes, they've been successful, but I have a better mousetrap. It is about building that better mousetrap. And do you have more that are coming, that are different? So better may not be the right word you're looking for, but that are unique from anyone else. I think as a caterer, a caterer may not sound real, real exciting to some of you. I happen to have passion about it, okay? But there are things that I do as a caterer that are different than anybody else which made me the best in what I do. For example, when I first started catering, the idea of, and still is from some people, the idea of a wedding reception in Utah was to have my temple mint, my nut cup, my little fruit kebab, and a chicken salad sandwich. And you put that on a little plate and you set it out on a long banquet table in a culture hall, people came by and picked it up. It was about the most unexciting thing there was. So, as I had passion, I also had ideas. It wasn't just a, oh, I, I, wanna, I, wanna make, I wanna make better food than that. That's not enough. I had a passion about it, but I had to have ideas. I had to have ideas of how to do that. And not only idea one and idea two, idea two I had to have number 59 and number 320. I published on my website all my ideas. Once a month, I send out a recipe a month, and anybody can sign up. Every one of my competition have my recipes. They all go on my website. I have over 5,000 photos on my website. They all have my ideas on how to set up a new idea. People say to me all the time, are you afraid to put that on the website? What if, what if they read it and discover it? So of course they read it and discovered it. But I'm not afraid of competition because there's always another idea out there that's even better. And they're constantly playing catch up with me and I'm setting the trend. That's why I'm better. Because I'm leading the pack. I'm the trendsetter. It's not that somebody, and I have the courage to do it. It's not that I the, have unique, have, I'm the only one who's ever thought of it, but I may be the first one in this community that's thought about it. Those are the kind of things that make me better, that can make you better. <laughs> so if you have passion about something and you have ideas that see you into the future, you know you're gonna be better at it. Those two things come together at the same time to make the same concept. Did I answer that? Yeah. 
You can sign up for my free recipe of the month club on my website. My last name. Clever. <sighs> Time. Okay, great. So as I identified my opportunities, at first I started selling Avon door to door because I could take my children with me, pull them in their wagon. And then as people were buying that Avon from me, I realized that it was irresistible to buy from a woman who was pulling her two children in her red wagon. <laughs> so what if you sold something else? What if you sold cookies with your Avon? What if you sold bread? What if you handed out a flyer that talked about being, having a birthday party for your kids? And I sewed a suit, clown suit, went out, bought my big hair, big shoes, my nose, my face paint, handed out pictures and flyers of me going door to door, and I still pulled that red wagon. Hi, and if you need something, you call me. This is slowly but surely, I would do whatever it took. I would get in a clown suit today if I thought it was what was needed for my family and for my company. There's nothing below. There's no job too small. The reason my crew are so incredible is because there isn't anything that I ask them to do that I either am not willing to do or haven't done that they see me do. One of my favorite things to do at events is to bust the tables. I love to talk to the people. I'm out there, oh, hi, how are you? Can I take that from you? How was everything this evening? Oh, you need a little extra water. Let me get that for you. I love that. I'm out there on the floor. I love they're talking to people. I love interacting with them. I don't just like standing right there, oh, get that over there, get that over there. I'm working. When I'm at, I don't attend every event now. I mean, we have 600 events a year. Of those 600 events, I maybe attend 30. But the 30 that I'm on, my staff see me. And I'm working and I have a presence. OK, so maybe more like 45. Two a month? Three a month? Yeah, something like that. So I identified something that I could do and something that I felt I could be really good at. I love to cook. I've always loved to cook. When I was eight years old, my favorite thing to do was have tea parties. I would invite all my friends over. I would get out the little saltine crackers, make some frosting, put the little buttercream icing in the saltine cracker, put the little, I had a little sandwich, my little tea set. Oh, so that's not just cooking, that's entertaining. I love to entertain. I love to throw parties. Let's see, cooking, throwing parties. I think they call that catering. In Iowa, in my town of 250 people, do you think we had such a thing as catering? You think we ever heard about anything like that? No. You think they think we knew about any of those kind of things were uh, fine dining? Nothing. So education. Education is a big piece of becoming an entrepreneur. Yes, you may have passion about it, but you have to educate yourself in what it is you have passion about. Julia Child was the woman of the hour when I was educating myself. She was the only one on TV. She was on PBS on Saturday morning. Food Network, no one heard of that, okay? Martha Stewart, wasn't even born yet, okay? Ask me, I think Martha and I are about the same age, actually. <laughs> she certainly wasn't popular. But Julia Child, I watched her every Saturday morning. Oh, I've got my impeccably clean spoon, and I'll be stirring this mixture here. And I loved her. And I thought, I want to be just like her. I want to cook. I want to have passion. I want to be funny. She had the driest sense of humor. I loved her. I want to have a cooking show. I set my mind to that. 13 years, PBS, I had a cook public television cooking show. And I loved every minute of it. Part of that experience of being in front of that camera has allowed me to be here today. It's part of that education process. I got this microphone on. I knew right how to put it on, didn't I? See? I knew just how to do that. So I educated myself, learned everything I could. I read cookbooks front to back, experimented recipes front to back, and really became versed in what I was going to do. And I identified within this community a need. 
So I had passion, tested my recipes, became really knowledgeable, felt I was going to be really good, better than anybody else in this community 35 years ago. Now I got competition, nipping at my heels all the time. A need in the community. Catering here, 35, 28 years ago, was that little plate. I decided, okay, we have LDS receptions, they can't afford to have this big dinner, but what can they do and put on that little plate that's not that? So I got my brain thinking again. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? I came up with the concept of doing a dessert buffet. Now, now that may sound like old hat to you. You see dessert buffets all the time. No one had done it here before. The concept of walking into a wedding reception and having this magnificent display of desserts had never been done. Oh, you're looking at her. Okay, now, I try not to do that, but, and now people walk, but it was revolutionary. When the Olympics came to Salt Lake City, I'll never forget uh, when the Olympic Committee said to me, or Sports Illustrated actually said to me, we're gonna have these four mega parties and we'd just like to have something there that's never been done before. Serious? What do you want me to do? Reinvent chocolate? <laughs> so I thought, thinking, what am I going to do? I'm going to do these parties. I said, these are our mega parties. Everybody who was anybody wants a ticket to the Sports Illustrated parties. So I started looking, educating, looking out, thinking what? What can I do? In Toronto, I found a little company that was making a little machine that when you melted chocolate, you put it into it, and guess what? It flowed out. It was called the chocolate fountain. I went to Toronto. I bought three of those machines. I came back. I served them at the Sports Illustrated party. It was all over the New York Times about these amazing chocolate fountains at the Olympics in Salt Lake City. The distributor, the guy who manufactured them, called me from Toronto and said, do you want to distribute those? I went, nah. <laughs> Missed entrepreneur opportunity. I said, eh, you know, I'm sure they're going to come and go. And they have. They have come and gone. But I was the first person to bring those chocolate fountains into the United States because of what we did at Sports Illustrated parties. They were all over the news. And then, of course, now everyone had a chocolate fountain. Now you couldn't serve, get me to serve one because you put a gun to my head. I hate them. But that's part of the process. That's having another good idea down the road. How I'm serving chocolate now. And now I make a river of chocolate. I'll tell you about that another time. Vetting your opportunities. This is the discovery phase. Learn all you can about this sweet spot. Okay? This is the phase I didn't do very well because my back was against the wall. I had to start making money and making money quick or my family was going to be on the streets. I wish I'd spent more time in that sweet spot in learning about it, in the vetting phase. But you're in a different situation. You're here, you're in this class, you're in the discovery phase, and you have something that I didn't have. You have that magnificent thing called the internet. What a tool is that? When I wanted to learn how to make a poached salmon, I had to go to the library, check out a cookbook, get home, open it up, try it four or five times, and then finally get it right. All you have to do is go to the internet, go to get the recipe, go to YouTube, watch a video on it, but it's done. You want to find out how many catering companies there are along the Wasatch Front and what your competition looks like? You go to the internet. I mean, you want to find out anything. You want to find out people's success rate, what's failure, case studies. You go to the internet. You have a tool I didn't even have. When I started out, I was typing on a Smith Corona. Now, how many of you know what a Smith Corona is? One, okay, two, <laughs> as a typewriter, okay. The computer, it was invented since I started my company. The internet. Thank you, you know, to all those people who think they invented the internet. Fax machines. When the fax machine first came along, I was like, I don't know, I think that's going to last. The fax machine, I don't know. After enough people said to me, you know, can you fax me something? And I was tired of running across the street to my neighbors and asking, can you fax this for me? I said, I better buy one. So I bought 
that phone. So I bought a fax machine. And then I had enough people saying to me down the road, can, can you email me that? Email. We're going to, I got to fix this. Hang on, it's driving me crazy. I know, short drive. OK. Finally, I said, well, I think I can email that to you as soon as my kids get home, because they can do it. <laughs> well, now, you live by technology. You hold it in the palm of your hand. It can be your greatest friend or your worst enemy. But it's something I didn't have. But this is another way that you can vet yourself and your sweet spot other than technology. Once you've identified this, there may be other people who are something like your sweet spot. Follow them. Follow them online. Follow them in real life. Send them an email. Contact them on, contact, get it. If you're not on LinkedIn, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you should be. Contact them. Introduce yourself. Let them know who you are. Right now, don't wait till you graduate. Ask them, tell them how great they are. Well, entrepreneurs, we love that. We love to hear how great we are. And say that, you, that you've actually selected them to shadow. And you've really been following them on the news. You like what they're doing. Could you just spend a day with them and see what they do? They, aren't, most entrepreneurs would say yes to that. Get you in the door. I would love to work for you for nothing. It's the greatest schooling you could ever have to work for an entrepreneur for nothing, for whether it's one week, two weeks, a month, a summer. Do you know how many chefs I have working for me now because someone called me and said that? A lot. A lot from this UVU program. Wedding planners, different people, front office people. And that someone will send me an email and say, hi, I've always loved what you've done. I've seen you talk. I'm, always, you know, I'm wondering if you have any openings. That tells me nothing about what they bring to the table for me. But if I have someone who says, I saw this, this, this is what I bring to the table, and I would give my eye teeth just to volunteer my services and follow behind you for a week. And come on. I've had a lot of people come on. I've trained a lot of people. I've had someone try and start catering business after they've been with me. <laughs> it's the same thing. Why I don't mind giving away my recipes and why I don't mind putting it on the internet is because a good recipe does not a caterer make. Everyone now can have a good recipe. It's a lot more to be able to execute with precision and flawlessness an event. And I'm one of the few that can do that. So I don't mind giving away the things that intrinsically, I don't mind giving away the paraphernalia because they can't repl replicate what's intrinsically inside me. There's a piece intrinsically inside of you where your passion is, that's your sweet spot that nobody else can replicate. I know this is a state university, but I'm only going to say this once, so don't stone me. Your competition and the world cannot take away from you what God has given you. All right. I told you I was going to say it once. Going on. Okay. So, with so much information at your fingertips, how can you possibly fail? Yet people do. People still fail. And it lies in that final step, execution. Execute your idea. Some of the reasons people fail is maybe they're underfunded. Maybe they lack the commitment. Maybe they get too far in debt. Maybe they get ahead of themselves. I can't tell you how many people I've seen who are in that situation, who start a business, and they have a pretty good idea, and they start to get a little income, Next thing you know, they're driving a Jaguar. And they got some kind of crazy, you know, $1,000 a month payment on it. And then they're end up buying a house, you know, six bedroom house up here. And then they've got some crazy payment on that. And then they, because they just, you know, believe it's going to keep rolling in. And next thing they know, they, they get ahead of themselves. They get in debt. Some people, just too hard work. 
Maybe you're going to be one of them. Maybe you're one that found that sweet spot, but when you got there, man, that's hard work. I didn't want to work this hard. I thought I was going to be living the easy life. I thought I was going to be my own boss with a lot of money. I didn't know this was really going to be hard work. Nobody, nobody talked about that in being an entrepreneurship. Not one of you said, I want to be an entrepreneur so I can work my ass off. <laughs> nobody said that. <laughs> but let me tell you, you got to. That's part of being an entrepreneur. It's not sitting back in this chair and just going, oh yeah, I got an easy street now. I got the culture. I got my passion. It's all about no. That hard work ahead of you. Harder work than you ever imagined. And some people just don't have what it takes to stick with something, even though they may know it's their sweet spot. They choose an easier way. For me, I always believed. I always believed in my dream. And even at the points when I'm like, well, it's not looking good, guys, I never gave up on it. I was not afraid of hard work. I was willing to make whatever sacrifice needed to stand by my company. And I made a decision at the very beginning to stand by five principles. And to stay true to those principles no matter what. So that when I was being pushed, my feet were firm. My principles that I live by, and I'm not going to, I give a whole lecture on these principles, but we're not even going to talk about them today. I'm going to tell you what my principles are. And I put them into my mission statement. I'm committed to be of, ex, to be of service through excellence, abundance, and integrity. So those are my five principles. I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm committed more than you can possibly know. You got that? To be of service. If I can't be of service in this life, nothing else for me. Through excellence, that's bringing my best every day. Not perfection, which will kill you, but my best, excellence, which inspires me every day. Through abundance, which is believing that there is enough for all. And I do not have to lie, cheat, and struggle, and put down my other guy to succeed. And integrity. That I stand for something that is right and good. And that when push comes to shove, the temptation's there to cheat on taxes, to not be honest about something, that I don't have to be questioned. Those five principles have led my business and the growth of it and are the reason I am the largest caterer in the state of Utah and nine times best of state because people trust me to live by these principles no matter what. I wish you the best. Questions, answers? Well, you have this really solid job um, with the, the state, and then you decided to go ahead and, and do your own thing. How did you, how did you muster up the courage to do that? Besides just saying, I'm going to go door to door to sell Avon now. I'm leaving my security behind me. Um, very personal. Uh, I came home from work one day and my husband, who was not able to hold down a, down a job, was uh, tending and I had a two-year-old and one brand new baby. And they were both crying. And he was in the bedroom with his pillow over his head. I knew I was never going to leave that place again. My commitment to those children was stronger than any security over there. And the next morning I went in and I quit. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't even give you two-week notice. And I went home. And I never left them. So how do you pay the bills in between you trying to follow the you know, pay them that month? I mean, what do you do? 
That first month I had $150. That was it. And that wasn't enough. So I called everybody. I told them what I was doing. I called the phone people, the electric people. I called my mortgage people. I called the car people. I was in debt over my head in a place I shouldn't have been, and I've never been there since. And I told them what I was doing. And I said, so I just need to know how many months do I have before you're going to cut off the power? Three months. Okay. I just want you to know what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you up front. You're not going to get a payment from me, but I will pay you at the end of that three months. I called my mortgage company. I asked for the same leniency from them. They said no. And I said, how long do I have before you go into foreclosure? Six months. Okay? I got it. I need you to renegotiate an interest rate with me because I can't make it if you don't. And you're going to have this house back in your lap. It's a condo. Really. Can you want to you want to market that condo? Really? Seriously? And I talked to everybody. I didn't try and hide what I was doing. I was completely up front with people and I let them know. And without exception, everyone was supportive of me. Even people who shouldn't have been. Like, well, you know, I really I can't say we're not gonna be able to do that, but good luck to you. <laughs> Thanks. And I made it. So sometimes you have to make sacrifices. Along the way, they did come and get my car. I didn't know that's how they repossessed cars. I thought they called you and said, hi, we're coming to get your car. <laughs> Instead, you wake up in the morning and you open the window like, my car's gone! <laughs> oh my gosh! So I called the police. Please, did somebody took my car in the night? <gasps> What's your address? What's your name? I told them, they said, oh, it was repossessed. What? <laughs> I have the keys. They didn't need them. What? <laughs> I just put new cars, new tires on the car. Are you serious? <laughs> I lost my car. <laughs> Here's my last piece of advice for you. And this is critical. It's the most important thing I've said all day. And you don't have to write it down because you're never going to forget it. Get out of debt. Whatever piece of crap you're driving today, drive it until it's been paid for, and you save enough money to buy the next car free and clear. You do that one time, and the rest of your life, you'll buy a car with cash. So think about what you're driving. Think about how long before you're going to have it paid off. Oh, I'm going to make double payments. Then think about how long it's going to take you. Do you know how long I drove my 69 Cutlass? The red velour fabric inside was no longer red velour. <laughs> the black exterior, which was so fun when I bought it, was gray and cracked. But today, I have a car with red on the outside and black on the inside. And it's a pretty sweet Mercedes, and I paid cash for it. Because I did it one time. Live debt free. It is the most freeing thing you will ever do for yourself and your family. Now, can you never be in debt? Yes, but think seriously. Never be in debt for a depreciable thing. Cars depreciate, clothes depreciate, vacations depreciate. You can be in debt for stuff that appreciates where you get ahead of the interest you're paying. A home, hopefully, appreciates. If you invest in your company, in your business, I ran my company debt-free for 27 years. In year 28, I took on a mortgage in Salt Lake of that building because I see it as a growth step that's appreciating my business. Okay? So you can have debt for appreciable things. But the reason I was able to go out and get that size of a loan was because I had lived this way for this many years and people clamoring, hey, you want, here, we'll give you money, 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 money. You want money? Here, we'll give it to you. I'm like, settle down, boys. I'll let you know how much I need and when I need it. See what a great position that is to be in? Because of those five principles and the biggest one being integrity. They knew if I signed my name to the bottom of that paper, no matter what, they were being paid. Thank you for being here.